welcome back to the Korean Art Podcast and the literature series of our podcast. And uh, this uh, guest is a previous uh, a returning guest from the podcast and someone we had on last summer. And last summer we spoke about Hangul, the history of Hangul, uh, how it's become nationalised and all the complex issues around that. I'm going to link that below. But today we're going to speak about his new book and this is going to be about James Scarf Gale. Um, so, uh, Daniel Pieper, welcome back to the podcast. Yes, hello. Thanks for having me back. And I sh- yeah, and I should mention you're making a move to Australia soon to be lecturer in Korean studies at the University uh, of Monash. So uh, congratulations on that as well, as well as the new book. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so excited about the, the new position and the move. Can't wait. Yes. Um, so uh, as a very first question, I might get you to for, I might get you to introduce your book instead of me. I'm probably going to butcher it and I might want to get you to do it in your own language just to let the listeners know what the book is. But I, I suppose as you introduce the book, perhaps introduce uh, who Gail was as well and why um, this book is so important. And uh, and I suppose also that that huge archive of documents that is sitting in the University of Toronto. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd love to uh, discuss it. Uh, as you mentioned, it's uh, my new book. Um, I should say completely mine. I, I am the editor and uh, I provide introductions and contextualizations, but um, uh, the vast majority of it is by this scholar missionary, James Scarth Gale, who um, uh, lived in Korea some 40 years from 1888 to 1927. Um, and so this is a re- presentation of his, um, some of his unpublished typescripts. Um, and I say typescripts, not manuscripts, because they were um, the uh, manuscripts um, typed up on, on a typewriter. Uh, so he, he had a, a kind of um, method for dealing, for writing things. First, he would do it handwritten, and then he would type it up. And anything that was typed up was almost nearing publication. So we know that these two typescripts were in the final form right before what he thought would would be published, but alas, they were never published. Um, and they can be find along with, found along with many other writings in the James Scarth Gale papers in um, the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library in at the University of Toronto. Um, so, to discuss uh, the works of James Scarth Gale, we have to we have to go back to um, sometime around 2002, 2003, where my previous um, PhD advisor Ross King first started digging into these papers um, with the the hunch that perhaps there was more there than just boxes and boxes of uh, diaries, which is what they were originally um, labeled. And lo and behold, there was much, much more there. Very little was actually personal writings. The vast majority were um, the translations, English translations of classical Korean literature um, in, in these boxes. Um, translations that never actually got published, never saw the light of day. Um, so this is where these typescripts that became this book were drawn from. Uh, so that's the background of, of this book. Um, to give you an idea of who James Scarth Gale was, uh, he is important for a lot of reasons and important in a lot of um, fields of Korean studies for a number of reasons. Um, some of the first, some of the areas in which he was groundbreaking, he was the first to translate a work of Korean literature into English and the first to translate a work of English literature into Korean. Um, and just for those two reasons alone, his uh, name should be remembered in um, Korean liter- literary history. But more than that, he was also a lexicographer. He was the first to compile an unabridged English uh, Korean dictionary in um, 1897. And he was also deeply involved in translations of the Bible into Korean. And he had one of the earliest um, complete translations of um, the Old and New Testament into um, in, into Korean. Um, and there's a there's a reason why he had his own translation. 
there was a, a board of translators, the official board of translators that was involved in, in translating um, the, the Bible into vernacular Korean. But um, he, he didn't see eye to eye with many of his fellow board members. He thought that uh, the Korean Bible should speak um, to the Korean uh, parishioner, to the, the believer in his own language. It, it should speak in a, a colloquial type of fashion that could speak to the soul of um, the convert or um, potential convert, uh, if you will. Whereas many of um, the louder voices on the, the Bible translation board thought that it should be as literal as possible with, with the original. Um, in other words, if the original said God in this particular pas passage, then the Korean version must say God for every one-on-one, -on -one, you know, equivalent um, word for word translation. And so for this reason, he eventually had a falling out with the, the Bible translation board and took his own um, unauthorized translation of the Bible and published it privately. And it's still out there today, the unauthorized Gale translation of the Bible. Um, so I've gone off on a little tangent there, but for those main reasons, um, it, it's important to, to know why he why he is important in Korean uh, not only Korean um, literary history but also translation history and in Korean studies in the West he he can be considered um, probably the first Koreanist uh, like myself a, a Western person who who studies Korea he he in many ways um began the the field of Korean studies in the West. Um, he and um, figures like Homer Holbert, who was also a scholar missionary. And it's important to keep in mind um, that as well as, as we move forward in the discussion that uh, Korean studies in the West is very much enmeshed with uh, scholar missionaries and Christian missionary activities in Korea. It, it was such that the most active movers and shakers in Korea at the time in the 1890s and 1900s um, were there as, as missionaries, mostly from uh, the United States and, and Canada. I, th I think we should plant uh, just one more flag post before we jump into your analysis and the interesting content here. And that is the um, remarkable time that Gail was in Korea and writing about Korea. It was a uh, hugely transformative uh, period, um, to, uh, tumultuous, you know, huge changes were happening across the peninsula um, and uh, a rapidly modernizing country, a country that was moving from dynasty into colonial rule and a whole number of changes that were happening very quickly. So I might get you to just to plant that because that will also go on to explain um, why his writings are so fascinating to look through. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, we would be remiss to uh, not point out the historical the background um, during the time when, uh, when Gail was, was residing in Korea. Um, I mentioned that he first traveled to Korea in 1888 um, from Canada. He's um, originally, originally um, Canadian. Um, well, he continued to have Canadian citizenship, but he worked with an American mission while in Korea. He first went there in 1888. Now, for some background, Korea was only opened to Western missionary activity two years prior to that. Um, so there were only a handful of, of um, Westerners in Korea at the time. He quickly, um, <clears throat> excuse me, he quickly distinguished himself uh, for his language ability. He threw himself into um, studying the language with, um, with much enthusiasm. He surpassed some of his colleagues that had been there before him. Uh, he continued to study the language. He got into um, translation, as I said, uh, lexicography. Um, and that brought, that would bring us into the 1890s when um, some notable historical events that happened, uh, the Sino, the first Sino-Japanese War, 1894 to 1895, the Kabul reforms, which um, attempted to, uh, drastically reform much of uh, traditional Korean, uh, Korean culture and politics, also in 1894 to 96. Um, the uh, growing rivalry between um, Japan and Russia after 
uh, China's defeat in uh, 1895, and then you have the Ru Russo-Japanese War in um, 1905, which would solidify Japan's victory, would solidify its presence in Korea. Um, the implementation of the um, Protectorate Treaty the same year in 1905, then the annexation by Japan in 1910, um, and sort of ushering in uh, Gale's, the second half of uh, the second 20 years of it, his time in Korea uh, up until um, 1927. So th there are two typescripts that make up this book and each of them are sort of a distillation of the two eras of Gale's time in Korea, the, the two kind of periods, if you wanna break up his 40 years into two periods the pre-annexation period, the early years, 1880s, 1890s, and then into the colonial period, uh, where um, from the, I think uh, from the late 19 teens, he, he tends to turn away from just anthropological observations and um, any sort of political writings. He turns from that toward more engagement in classical Korean literature in classical Chinese. And I think this is a reaction against uh, the political nature, uh, the Japanese takeover. I think he turns away from the political world toward the literary during this time. Um, so yeah, you can see many uh, epical events happening in these 40 years when, um, when Gale is living there. I mean, we, we say this so much about Korean history in the 20th century, if so much happened, I uh, changed so much, but um, I think particularly during this period, it was a very tumultuous period. Many, many things were happening in, in quick succession. Well, let's um, launch into the content here. And I might start with something you mentioned just before, the, um, uh, that Gale was a, a career file. And he was a remarkable career file, especially during the time. So I believe he spent time in Busan, Seoul, and settled up in Wonsan for most of his period. But um, you, in your writing here, have got some really interesting quotes. I'm going to put some through here. So it starts here, and you write that um, he was uh, known to have been going native, and that's a quote. And it, it, that has uh, a really interesting um, um uh, connotations here because I'm going to quote Gail here. Um, so here we go. There are so few foreigners in, in this great city and they naturally cling together. And this is what he's trying to avoid. He tries to avoid this trap that many other foreigners seem to want to do when they come to many countries, of course, and that is to cling together. He spreads out and he lives in many ways a very Korean life. And uh, it seems from your writing here, this really did endear himself to the local population. Um, yeah, I, I believe that it did. When, when I, it's interesting you bring up this quote because I, I was just reading it earlier, rereading it. Um, and it reminds me still of um, many expats, as you mentioned, um, in Korea or in many countries today that, um, and Gail said this in his writing, um, there are so many foreigners here that necessarily cling to each other and spend more time than they probably would back home together, <laughs> um, as if their shared, you know, um, expat identity somehow, you know, brings them together. And and he has a reaction against this, and he um, consciously decides to to break away from this and to go into parts of the country where n no other foreigners live, and to try and actually, you know, um, get back to what he sees as the reason that he's there is to proselytize to the population, not to, you know, hobnob and rub elbows with other, other foreigners. Um, and so that's what he did. Um, and from records of his time there, it did endear him to the population. He did make many friends and um, did live in many different areas of the peninsula. Um, I'd, I'm not so sure how effective his early efforts were. Um, without really the institutional support of the mission behind him. Um, but I do think it was very um, formative in his own, in his, his own uh, later approaches to Korean studies and making him the Korean studies scholar that he later would become. 
that initial period of, of um, just living in far flung areas of the peninsula and uh, learning the language as he did. Let's uh, launch into the other side of that then, because the, the, there's a, a wonderful part in um, your, I believe it's int your introduction to the book, where you uh, really delve into this and you say, well, there is one side of it that we just touched on there, and yet there is a completely other side of this. Of course, as you said, Gail is in Korea as a, as a missionary, and he has this this um, unique kind of love and attachment to Korea and the old Korea. But at the same time, he is, um, he, he's, there's, there's a tone within his writings of a Western modernist triumphalism. And this is in some ways unavoidable. He is there after all to spread the word of Christianity. And he believes that this is a positive force in the world. So in some ways, he also wants to change Korea. And so it's a tricky dichotomy. Right, right. And, and that is, um, really the the crux of, of much of the book and um, speaks to the title redemption and regrets because um, on the one hand he he is a, a Koreophile um, a budding Koreanist um, he has a burgeoning knowledge of the country and the language um, a desire to learn more but at the end of the day he is a missionary and there are things that he cannot abide by and so um, what I see through his writings is this continuing, um, evolving uh, interaction with with Korean culture, and that he's constantly trying to come to terms with um, Korean culture as a whole, as a whole, and trying to disentangle what is, um, in his mind at least, what is salvageable what what is good what is uh, genuinely korean and and what is uh, simply superstition and what, what needs to to go in order to um, bring about a a modern a modern korea and and i think at many times this this brings about a a kind of um ambiguity in his thinking and ambivalence on the one hand he is fascinated with classical korean literature um Confucian Korean literature. Um, on the other hand, this doesn't have anything obviously to do with Christian conversion, right? Um, most of his, the vast majority of his uh, missionary colleagues have no interest in classical Korean literature at all, classical Chinese literature. Um, and there are some records of them asking him, you know, what, why are you wasting your time with that? What does that have to do with creating more Christians. Um, but he, he has this, you know, continuing and in many ways deepening relationship with classical Chinese literature. Um, and so we also see this coming out in his evangelization strategy, and that is his attempt to find this, this connection with Christian thought, the Christian thought world and Confucianism as embodied in classical Korean literature. And, and so this really builds the foundation of his uh, scholarly slash evangel evangelization um, strategy, his, his, his kind of um, his thinking while in Korea. Um, and this extends more and more to other facets of his approach to Korean culture in general. We can see this in his approach to Dangun as well. Dangun, of course, is the, the sort of semi-legendary, uh, um, semi-godlike figure that uh, was the progenitor of the Korean race some um, 4,000 years ago in 2333 BCE. And so we can see in some of his writings his attempt to draw a parallel between the, um, the trinity and the Christian religion and the trinity of um, Hanin and Hanung and, and Dangun, who are the three godly figures that um, bring about the, the Korean race and, and Korean um, folklore. And so th there's another example of him, Gail, trying to come to terms with, you know, um, his, his background as a, as a uh, Christian missionary and also his burgeoning interest and engagement with uh, Korean literature and culture. 
I want to introduce uh, a character in this, and this is a this I found personally really quite interesting. And this is Gail's um, opinions about Kim Ko Jong. Um, I found this really quite gripping. And throughout his writing, you write that he is often infantilizing Kim Ko Jong, um, referring to children. I'm going to quote you here. Actually, you say. Gail depicts a deeply superstitious and dangerously ignorant monarch at the helm of a doomed vessel. So it really is a, a fascinating look from an outsider um, into a country that he um, and a monarch who he sees uh, um, in some ways de destroying a country that he loves. And so this, this is a fascinating view here. So take us there to um, Gail and his opinions of Kim uh, Ko Jong. Okay. Um Yes, he he didn't have much good to say about uh, King Kojong um, in pen pictures. Uh, pen pictures, of course, is the the first of the two typescripts. Pen pictures wasn't written at the same time, but it's a collection of different essays and musings and observations written um, from roughly eighteen ninety five up to nineteen ten, and and so this was a, a very very critical time for Korea. This is where Korea went from a kingdom, the Joseon kingdom, to actually an empire in 1897, and then to a protectorate and to a, um, a colony of Japan, all within a 15-year um, period, roughly. Um, and this was a time that brought out the most exasperation in Gale's writings. And much of that exasperation was directed at Kojong. Because in Gale's eyes, it seemed that while Ko Jung wasn't, wasn't a bad person, um, he had good intentions, but at least in the observations of Gale and most, I must add, other Western observers at the time, Ko Jung was um, hopelessly out of his element. Um, he didn't know exactly what was going on around him, and he was being manipulated and taken advantage of by other international actors at the time. Um, I, I, I must point out, I should point out that um, recently there's been sort of a, a reappraisal of Ko Jung's rule and um, highlighting of many of the positive reforms that he actually did make. Um, mostly this has been happening in um, Korean language scholarship over the past 15 years. And um, basically the argument here is that uh, the the cards were stacked against Korea at this time. It didn't have a lot of hope of reforming that quickly, um, especially with the, you know, the um, less than honorable intentions of international actors at the time who had a stake in, in trying to take advantage of Korea. Um, within those parameters, though, King Ho Jong was doing as much as he could, and he made some headway in certain areas. But when it came down to it, um, the Korean kingdom could not, simply could not shore up enough resources to make any kind of meaningful reforms within that um, short frame of time. But it is also true, uh, back to Gale, that at that time, um, most international observers agreed that King Ko Jong um, was, was not completely capable of of making the reforms, nor could was he even totally aware of, of what was going on. Um, so if we were to take, if we were to try and place Gale within the spectrum of um, observers at the time, being more or less critical of Ko Jung, I would put Gale toward the more critical end of that spectrum. But then I also mentioned in the introduction that um, it, it wasn't simply a criticism based on uh, some sort of hate or distrust of Ko Jong as necessarily a, a tyrant or anything like that, but but rather of an exasperated friend um, trying to trying desperately to um, convince another friend to to reform uh, to reform one's life or something terrible is going to happen because in other in other areas. Um, Another of his writings after annexation in 1910, uh, Gale is, is more understanding of Ko Jung's uh, predicament um, and expresses as much. So um, we can really see his most pointed criticisms, though, right around um, 1895, 1896, 1897. This is when um, 
In fact, uh, the queen, um, queen was assassinated by what looked like to have been um, Japanese agents. King Kojong had to flee the palace and was in the, the, the um, Russian legation for uh, about a year. Um, this is when we see some of the, the most pointed criticisms coming from Gail. How, um, how central to Gail's translations was his um, Christianity and his proselytizing? Because uh, as you write in your, in your introduction here, there's been a tendency um, throughout history here, or at least recent history, to um, view Gail through either hidden, a historical lens or a, or a um, Christian missionary lens, but it, it, they don't tend to fuse the two. And I get the impression, correct me if I'm wrong, that you, through your book, uh, you're trying to dispel in some way this misnomer and fuse the two together and say that they are one. There's a holistic approach to this. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, what I try to do uh, through this project um, is to, to try and show to try and write somewhere in between um, previous writings on Gale. Um, on the one hand, most Korean language writings on Gale have attempted to, and, and you know, scholar missionaries like him in general have attempted to disentangle um, their scholarly contributions and their missionary ones, and have tended to give more weight to their missionary contributions, but only within a certain parameter, and to really, um, sideline their scholarly contributions. Um, in the West, though, th there's been kind of a tendency to discount scholar missionaries in general, although for different reasons, generally because um, the contributions of scholar missionaries are, are somehow somehow tainted or somehow um, beyond the purview of true scholarship because of those Christian um, associations. What I'm trying to do is present a scholar missionary such as Gale as a holistic human being, as as having those those biases, those beliefs, the the, uh, the influence of their faith, that also you know bleeds into um, their scholarly contributions. So to take the good and the bad, if you will, um, to to take this individual as as a whole, and and to to um, try try and uh, highlight how these different um, aspects of their personality, of their personage, um, actually influences their output, their scholarly output. Um, yeah, the, there is the question of, you know, the holistic approach to their, the legacy of, of uh, figures like Gale in general. Um, I think the first part of your question needs um, to be addressed as well, though. What Was this a part of their translation? Because mm, I, I yes, think so. the, mm. the true, I think the true legacy of, of Gale is as a literary translator. And there is the question, um, it definitely a, a legitimate question as to whether his scholar missionary um, background influences his, his translation. And in some of the most pointed criticisms um, leveled against Gale, do they affect his translations to the point where they are uh, not really serviceable anymore because they, they're so influenced by this Christian outlook that um, the reader can't get past it. Um, and I think the, the, biggest, the biggest area of influence there in terms of translation, I believe is his, um, this this kind of um what would you call it the the attempt to draw the connection between um confucian and christian life worlds uh, specifically in terms of the equation of um the confucian higher power or chun sometimes uh, translated as heaven the conflating of the confucian heaven with the christian heaven and um, in many of, of uh, Gale's translations, this is done almost automatically, um, where the, the ton in the original, that, that is, you know, in the Confucian sense of a higher power, or um, it's also uh, connected with the mandate of heaven, and 
the, the Chinese um, emperor and such. That, that has been systematically um, substituted with um, God or, or heaven in, in the Christian sense. And I, and I think that if one is not aware of, um, of Gail's strategy, his translation come uh, religious strategy, when he does that, it, it can be a little off-putting. It can take one um, by surprise. And it can even give one who has no experience with Korean literature the impression that Koreans at this time were, were Christian or had some sense of, of the Christian God. Um, so I, I think that is something that the reader has to be quite aware of. Um, and it, it is something that, yeah, the reader has to, uh, when they're engaging with these texts, they have to keep their eyes wide open and then, then you know, be aware that that's there. Um, having said that though, other than that, I don't, I don't see a, a very, an overpowering uh, Christian influence to his translations, no, no more than any other translations during the 20th century, I would say. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that, that is something to be aware of. I really hope you're enjoying this episode of the podcast and I apologize for this interruption, but I'm just going to take this moment to remind our listeners that we've made a conscious decision here in the Korean app podcast not to run advertising in any way. So if you do enjoy the podcast and you listen regularly and you do want it to continue, it is important that you do your best to support us at the links below or by sharing, liking or commenting on the podcast across social media. All your help in this regard is invaluable. And now back to the episode. As a final question on the topic of um, of religion and Christianity here before we push into the Japanese period, um, there is a you, you've mentioned Confucianism a few times and but there is an interesting moment um, in his writing here that I didn't know about until I read through your work here, where he, uh, I'm, uh, my question is, how, how, do, how does he treat Buddhism? Because he seems to have um, very conflicting views about it. I'm going to run a couple of quotes here. He, this is uh, uh, a quote from him. Buddhism, with its gilded idols and its awful representations of the ten hells that await mortals, is unintelligible. Is an, and it's unintelligible listening and it's immoral priesthood. Now that, that's a quote from him there, and he seems to be quite dismissive of it, of it. But on the other hand, you have other quotes in here where he talks about it um, being a, uh, a, a key central religion within Korea and it has a legitimate place and needs to be understood. So how does he approach Buddhism? Because he, he seems to have a great reverence for, uh, great reverence, but a reverence for Confucianism in some ways. And you mentioned it a bit there already, but he's, how, he seems from the writing here to be kind of torn about Buddhism. Yeah, I, I would say that um, I'm not sure exactly why, but his tone toward Confucianism, even from the beginning, uh, was quite positive. Um, from quite early on, we even see his willingness to, to see true connections between Christianity and Confucianism and to actually accord the status of religion to Confucianism. Whereas his, his feelings about Buddhism changed more over time. Um, they were generally more negative um, through the um, 1890s and the early 20th century. Um, but his writings on Buddhism changed over time. They softened over time. And by the end of his time in Korea, we see evidence of him seeing um, more, uh, more value in Buddhism, um, more uh, parallels with uh, the Christian faith, um, and a willingness to, to see um, Korean religion in an even more syncretic fashion than he had before. Seeing um, all the great knowledge systems in Korea, um, Taoism, Buddhism, Confucianism, as all of them having evidence of uh, recognition of a higher power. So there's a softening over time toward Buddhism, I think. There's a, um, I've heard people say this about Gail, um, 
and that is that he was a Japanese sympathizer or he harbored Jap uh, pro-Japanese sentiments. And um, you put some wonderful quotes in the book here where he acknowledges this. He realizes that this has been said about him and he is as confused as anybody. But you have a great take on this. I've never heard anyone properly explain this before. And you say that he was perhaps um, caught up in this uh, Korean minjok versus foreign uh, dichotomy that was um, hovering around at the time? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, there was that, it, it's interesting that he himself was, was aware that uh, others around him, both Koreans and his missionary colleagues, perceived him as, as pro-Japanese. Um, but if you, if you compare his writings over time and those with other Western Missionaries, at least those that remained in Korea, were allowed to remain in Korea. Uh, I don't, I don't see anything necessarily more pro-Japanese in Gale's writings than in others. Um, and it, it must be noted that Gale's second wife um, was actually born in Japan. She was a Caucasian woman, but she was um, her father was a businessman in Japan, and uh, she was born there. She sp spoke uh, fluent Japanese. Um, and partly for that reason, the Gales had a, a cordial relationship with um, the Japanese authorities after they took over. Um, and he, ex he explains it. I have the quote in my book that he thinks it's worthwhile that um, you know missionaries that remain here have are, are, are at least on good terms with the Japanese because they're going to be here for a while. We might as well be on good terms with them. But then we see um, increasingly and especially acutely after the, the crackdown on the March 1st movement um, in 1919, there's a turn against even any kind of tacit approval of uh, what the Japanese are doing in Korea. And this is where he, yeah, he turns against um, any inkling of um, support for Japan after that. And interestingly, after that, turns inwardly to... Um, to uh, classical Korean literature engagement with that. Um, I, I think this was partly because it, it just took him so long to be able to get to that linguistic level in Korean um, to actually be able to read classical Chinese. And, and that is also something I wanted to mention about um, his increasing, increasingly softened stance toward Buddhism. I think this also was partly because he was not in a position earlier to be able to understand Buddhist texts on the level that he could, <laughs> that, <laughs> that w was possible. Um, and I think as his uh, linguistic prowess increased, he was able to actually engage with these texts um, in the original and um, grasp their deeper meaning. And so I, I think this is why his stance um, changed as well. And so, yeah, back to the issue of Japan. Um, at, at one point, I think Gail also saw uh, a break in, well, he originally, he wrote that he originally thought that Japan might be the ideal country to reform Korea because they're both East Asian countries. They, they share many things culturally. But then Around the crackdown on the March 1st movement in 1919, when um, Japan actually killed many Korean protesters, around that time, he began to think that um, he began to see perhaps his expertise in Korean culture and his, um, his attempts to actually know Korean culture more deeply, even though he was a foreigner, that could... Um, actually bring him into closer understanding with Korea um, than Japanese administration, even though they happen to be both East Asian countries and, and share certain things culturally, uh, because they're not making an attempt to, to learn about Korea more deeply, the, their literature and their history, than um, in fact, uh, he was actually in a better position as the as the foreign uh, Anglophone literatus to to do that than the Japanese were. How um how uh, much do you think it played a factor into this? That as you write, 
um, his most blistering critique of Japanese rule, I think it's titled Why Japan Has Failed in Korea, was one of those unpublished documents sitting in the library in Toronto. Yeah, I, it's probably because he couldn't find a publishing outlet for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or perhaps because uh, he didn't want to be censured by the, the Japanese. But I mean, he did, he did publish other critical pieces around that time as well. Not quite as critical as that, but um, there was one that he published in the Japan Daily Mail, I believe, or Japan Weekly Mail. Um, and in that piece, in the margin, you can see written uh, three parts were toned down for the Japanese censors. He made a note on that. Um, so he did attempt to, and he did um, publish some pieces that were critical of Japan. He had to tone down parts of them to appease the censors. Um, so I'm, I'm not so sure it was because he um, he shied away from, uh, you know, making the censors angry. Perhaps it was more that he, he couldn't find uh, he couldn't find a, a venue that would uh, would publish his work, which was true of a lot of his works. Um, the vast majority of his works um, were never published. He was always looking for publishers, and he always had the problem that there was simply not enough interest in Korea. People in the West knew China, they knew Japan, um, but Korea was was somehow um, somewhere else. To, to borrow um, a term from a uh, a, a recent uh, work by uh, David Fields about Syngman Rhee, um, Korea was always about somewhere else. And that uh, policies being made that affected Korea were made based on other countries, such as China and Japan. This was true of Korean literature as well. Um, so Gail had these mountains of translations of Korean literature, and he was always looking for places to publish them and could never find a, enough venues for all of his works. So this was true of Korean literature and of, of essays like this on, on Korea, Japan's place in Korea. Let's uh, bring the discussion towards um, uh, Gayo's legacy in terms of his uh, translation and his work on the literary um, legacy of Korea in general. And I might actually read a quote here because I, I think there's going to be some similarities with our previous podcast, which I, of course I said I will, I will link below. But this is an inter interesting way to look at it. So this is Gayo. You say, Gayo's observations are snapshots of the pre-modern li linguistic hierarchy in, in Korea which positioned literary synetic as the ultimate medium of literature and the vernacular script onmun as a tool for assessing hanmun. So there's a lot there that I might get open up, especially those terms uh, onmun and hanmun. But uh, you, that's a great way to look at the position, the important position that Gail has here, as you say, uh, snapshots, or snapshots of Korea's legacy, especially its uh, pre-modern linguistic heresy uh, legacy. Yeah, yeah. Um Excellent questions. Um, this this again speaks to the the pivotal time during which Gail was um, was living in Korea. During those forty years, so much so much was happening. When Gail first went there, um, the unquestioned medium of Korean literature was literary Semitic classical Chinese, and it was unquestioned. That was simply what everyone did. To write in anything else for literature was simply unheard of. Uh, but then quickly after that, in the early 1890s, we, we see the first major challenges to this. Um, but despite these challenges, still overwhelmingly, it was classical Chinese. Um, and then in the early 20th century, we see the, the first breakthrough um, really into, um, you know, mixed script with um, nonfiction, uh, starting to see this genreification of Hangul for literary purposes and um, mixed script for nonfiction, and then this, this uh, precipitous drop of, of classical Chinese. Um, and then we, we can see it evidenced in uh, Gale's writings too. Um, he, he is aware of this. You can see early on that uh, he, he writes that uh, there's no literature in Korean. And he means, of course, no literature in Hangul, in vernacular, at least literature worth the name that uh, men of letters would actually take a second look at or, or write about. Um, 
But then from the early 20th century, we see him acknowledging, okay, there's, there's literature, but it's, you know, it's beyond the pale. It's, it's this, you know, dime store novel that uh, we can't really look at. Um, or it's, yes, it's there, but it has a long way to go. And it's at the expense of classical Chinese, which is still, you know, the literature par excellence. And then later from the 1920s, we see the further acknowledgement by Gale that, okay, now he sees the writing on the wall. Okay, vernacular literature is the wave of the future, but it still cannot hold a, handle, a candle to this classical idiom, which had recently been passing from, you know, the, the public sphere. And less and less men of letters could actually read or write in that. And so we, we see also him mentioning that, um, you know, the, the modern Korean man is an ignoramus. He doesn't know classical Chinese and he doesn't yet know how to write anything of, of um, worth in vernacular Korean. So he is, in fact, illiterate. Um, and he brings this up in, in a lot of his writings. But I think by the end of his tenure in Korea, he could see that, um, what we see as today as Korean vernacular literature um, flowering in the 1920s, what we see today is that um, he could see that rising, but still in his stubborn insistence, he was digging in his heels and looking back to the past. And I think this is also why we see this, this turn to classical literature um, in the late 19-teens and early 1920s on the part of Gale. He, he can see what the wave of the future is going to be, and he, he doesn't approve of it in his rather increasingly conservative outlook from the 1920s. And so he digs in and he looks toward the past, whereas yeah, the rest is, is history. As, as we know today, the 1920s are seen as the golden era of vernacular Korean literature. And this is another reason I think why he's not as seen as uh, favorably by um, Korean scholars because he was he was making a reaction against vernacular Korean at the very time where it was starting to to flower at least the, the way literary scholars see it today this um, efflorescence of of new Korean literature was just happening in the 1920s and at that very time he was turning toward the past and and just turning against that wave. Yeah, you mentioned Homer Hubert earlier. Is and uh, I know I don't have it in front of me at the moment, but I know in in your book you do talk about the um, the debate of sorts between the two men. Is this along the same lines? Yes, yes, it's uh, very much along the same lines. Um, I think this is a, a fairly well known well known debate in um, Korean studies circles, at least among people that. Um, study uh, scholar missionaries at this time. Um, what I don't think is is widely known is that it wasn't truly uh, an open debate. It wasn't truly the the, um, the, the open, uh, how should I say, the, the free thoughts of, of these uh, members of the debate in a, in a kind of spontaneous debate atmosphere. It, it was more of a, uh, sort of like a high school debate type forum where there was a prearranged um, platform that each debate contestant would, would take and, and would just, you know, take that, that side of the debate. But I mean, it, it's true, it's clear if we look at uh, the writings of Holbert and Gale afterwards that they believe more or less these positions and they continue to write along those lines. So I don't, I don't think they were randomly assigned these two positions. Um, but that really has formed the crux of, uh, of Korean studies in the West. That is the, the influence of, of China and the, the extent of the influence of China. And that's really the, the basis of this debate, um, whether whether Korean culture was more or less derived from Sinitic mainland culture. Um, and I think that continues much today. And uh, this is really the beginning of, of that debate, I would say, at least in Western circles, English language circles. 
is there any sense through the writing of Gale that he realized that the tide was against him in some ways? Not the truth was against him, because we can argue about how just how much the um the legacy of mainland China really matters here, but he certainly the nationalistic legacy was running against him. He, so um he seems to the the tide certainly was um uh, coming up for, uh, for him in this. So uh, is there any sense in his writing that he is losing this debate in national consciousness? I I don't think yes uh, is the, the short answer. I don't, <laughs> I don't think he would. I don't think he could have known how quickly um, it would have changed or was changing uh, right in the 1920s, or that the 1920s would be viewed so favorably as um, the first big efflorescence of modern vernacular Korean literature. Um, but yeah, I certainly think that by the 1920s, he was starting to realize that uh, classical Korean literature was, was gone and it wasn't coming back. Um, I think by that time he, he would have realized it, yeah. Um, his translation. Um... And I know you've written about this. Uh, how do you feel about his translation? We've spoken about how much um, Christianity and proselytizing may have slipped into it here. But uh, as as a as in terms of his style and how he did it, how do you see this? Um, or is, is because I know you've written somewhere about he has a tendency to domesticate Korean terms and, and things like this. So, uh, as, as an expert yourself, how do you how do you see um, his translation style? They are, they're still so eminently readable. Um, it, I, I'm still struck by the extent of knowledge of the language that he had to have had to, to be able to render such a readable translation. Um, because I, I think that the pitfall for a lot of translators is to adhere to a more literal translation closer to the original um, to almost use that original as as a crutch um, for a, a somewhat awkward translation. But someone with true knowledge of the original text can translate in such a way that divorces itself from the original, um, goes off on a sort of flight of fancy, and then comes back and writes a new translation that somehow keeps the essence of that original intact, which is something that he had a real knack for doing. Um, and it, it still strikes me, I'm um, reading it today, what level of Korean, and at his time it's saying something. I mean, in these days we have all these digital devices to help us, um, electronic dictionaries and, and whatnot, um, but for him to reach that level of Korean at that time is, is remarkable. Um, and so, you know, taking account of, of course, the, the Christian illusions and uh, things like that in his, in his translations, they, they're still, they're still very good. Um, they reflect superb Korean skills and they, if, if you're looking for something that's more readable and not so tethered, to the original, but still keeps all of that intact. Um, I, I would still recommend his translations very much. And um, many of them appear in this volume. As a, a final couple of questions here, I might start by um, asking about uh, your own work with Gail through this, this extremely important and large volume that you published here. Um, and you have commented on this as well in your writing and that it, it can be tricky at times to disentangle the character that Gail was. He, he's got, he wears so many hats at so many times to do so many things. So how difficult was the project that you put together here and how difficult was it disentangling, um, the character, the multiple characters that Gail wants? Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent question. Um, I guess would help to uh, explain a little bit about how I got involved in this um, mm. in the first place. This um, this book is the second in um, a proposed series of books uh, presenting uh, these unpublished works from the Gale Papers. Uh, 
I first got involved in this project back in, when was it 2000, 2000, oh, when was it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 13, uh, mm. 2013, when um, I uh, was assigned uh, the task with uh, many other colleagues at the University of British Columbia of um, inputting the handwritten notes of Gale uh, from his Gale papers. Um, so we had to put them into the word process them basically from the old yellowed manuscript, handwritten manuscripts um, into word process form. And they were very, very difficult to read at first. Not all of them were as difficult as the other, but um, there were a lot of cross outs and um, rewrites. Um, it, it took um, a couple of months to get used to his handwriting style after that it became easier so for about two and a half or three years um that was my job to read through his his old translations and essays and everything um and to word process that and so the reason i mentioned that is through those three years or so i, I felt like i i got to know this character more and more it was, it was about 20 hours a week i was doing it um and when you do something for that long with one person's writing, you, you get to know them somewhat. And so I, I, I build, built kind of a textual rapport with this person, I think. Uh, and so that, that was helpful to be able to approach his writing later when I, when I wasn't just doing these random essays, but when I could actually reach out for one of the, lower hanging fruits in the Gale papers, if you will, um, one of the typewritten works that was approaching a coherent, almost publishable um, finished product. And so by that time, um, I already had a feel for who this person was, his personality, how he wrote, how he approached Korean culture and translation. Um, so that, that helped a lot. And, and so, I was already thinking um, after those three years um, what sort of person this was, and and so when I could apply to that vague, when I could apply that vague idea to something more concrete, like pen pictures and old Korea, these two typescripts, then it, it was easier to to form a, a more coherent thesis on on who he was and what his writing was demonstrating. And um, as a last question, I might start with a quote here. You say, I seek in this volume to represent Gale at his, at his most raw and unvarnished. So I might ask you an incredibly difficult and expansive question to end here. Um, what, uh, what should be his legacy, looking back on him, having done all this work on him? How should um, we now approach Gale after, after now, not just um, what we've known about him for so long, but now uncovering so much more? Um, yeah, that's, that's a complex <laughs> question. Um, well, first and foremost, he was, he was a translator at heart, I would say. Um, and the thing with the translator is, um, it's never perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he, you know, his writing was at its most unvarnished. He, he was a flawed individual. Um, he had some perceptions of Korea, perceptions of Christianity, uh, Western triumphalism, social Darwinism. Um, he was a product of his time. He was flawed, but he was, he was a translator at heart, a literatus. He was a friend of Korea. Um, and he more than any other individual, I think was responsible for, introducing Korean literature to the Western world, even at times when that Western world was not interested and he couldn't find a venue for his translations or writings, uh, he, he kept on. Um, and even despite that sometimes lack of interest during his 40 year career, he has countless publications and even more writings that never were published. And so I, I hope through this project, we can bring some of those writings to light um, and share some of his still excellent, eminently readable 
um, amazing translations to to uh, public light. So that, of course, is a wonderful note to end the podcast on. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to link below our previous podcast, but I'm also going to link below, of course, uh, Daniel's book, which is Redemption and Regret, the Ambivalence of Korean Modernization in the Writings of James Scarth Gale, Missionary to Korea, 1888 to 1927. And uh, I won't just uh, put the description in the box below. I'm going to link it below so people can go and find it for themselves and uh, read through all the content that I didn't have time to for <laughs> this podcast. There is so, so, so much more there. I believe it's almost 700 pages, this book. So please uh, yeah. go ahead in the description and uh, find it for yourselves and uh, read it for yourselves as well. So on that, uh, Daniel Pieper, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for having me, Jed. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. This is just a final reminder that we've made a conscious decision here on the Korean Now podcast not to run advertising. And so the podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you do want it to continue, please consider supporting the podcast at the PayPal or Patreon links attached below. Or importantly, you can share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. And on that, I hope to see you again for the next episode. Thanks again for listening.